Hello, Rick here. This video today will be on the visor tech from Star Trek, looking at exploring just how it's depicted to work in the shows, as well as some real-life developments in this vein of technology. I'd like to quickly point out that blindness or damaged vision is not as simple as just not being able to see, and it has a myriad of causes, and therefore a variety of specialised treatments, not just the ones I'm looking at here today. The term is an acronym for Visual Instrument and Sensory Organ Replacement, and was created to allow those who were born blind, like LaForge, to see. It doesn't quite line up to one-to-one -to -one human sight, but does have several advantages and disadvantages over natural human vision. Geordie's visor for the longest time was a seldom seen piece of technology in the next generation, with even fellow Starfleet officers expressing curiosity at the device. In short, the visor acted as Geordie's artificial eyes in place of his own. It is in two parts, the external visor itself and the connections that are wired directly into the wearer's brain. The visor can detect well into the unperceivable ends of the EM spectrum, from 1 Hz to 100,000 terahertz, and interpret the received data as visual colours. This means that the wearer can see radio waves and other electromagnetic radiations. It can also perceive other effects, such as subspace phenomena, in a limited fashion. These signals are then transmitted via subspace field pulse, which compresses the information to the nodes at the ends of the device, where it rests on the side of the head. These then transmit via contact to the implants that are present on the wearer's temples, where they are then interpreted by the mind with the assistance of some neural wiring. The wearer's vision is not quite as a normal eye would see it. Colours and shapes can be more difficult to make out for the non-accustomed eye, but to a lifetime wearer it makes complete sense. A practised wearer can eventually use it to identify the infrared heat being given off by a person, and view the amount of sweat being excreted to gauge if someone is lying. Geordie also once joked he could use it to see through playing cards during a game of poker, although this seems unlikely. The visor's vision can be accessed remotely, and LaForge even tinkered with the notion of using it during away missions as a camera for the crew of the Enterprise to view through. However, in more nefarious ways, the subspace transmissions from the visor can be altered to transmit its viewpoint to another source. Such a vulnerability required access to the visor itself, but once established, was a remote connection. At one point, Romulan agents were able to use the direct interface that the internal elements of the visor provided to brainwash LaForge and use E-band transmissions to trigger implanted conditioning within him. It's a little known fact that continual use of the visor is actually painful. The direct connection to the wearer's nervous system causes frequent headaches, and in the beginning before acclimatisation it downright hurts. The wearer however gradually becomes used to its effects, with medication and natural tolerance, and Geordie Laforge eventually chose to forego as much medication as possible as it could interfere with the quality of the images he saw. Not every individual takes to a visor as well as LaForge, for some it simply would not work and others it was too painful. The earliest visors seen in canon were from 2257 and these were much bulkier models, with more extensive augmentation applied to the head, not just the small areas on the temples. And by 2373, the visor had been superseded by less obtrusive and more natural looking eye implants. There are non-canonical tales, suggesting that the accelerated development of such implants was to address the notable security issues associated with the visor. There are other technologies that can address issues of blindness in Star Trek. For example, cloning a new eye and implanting that is an option, but not one chosen by LaForge. Perhaps this is because his blindness was caused by a genetic defect and therefore his DNA was unusable in creating new eyes through cloning. This, paired with the Federation's stance on augmentation and genetic tampering, may have ruled out correcting his genome. 
Another alternative was the sensory webbing garment to be worn over the whole body, which emitted unperceivable, at least to human ears, sonic frequencies to effectively sonar and echolocate the surroundings, and converted the received information into a tactile sense. For those who think Star Trek doesn't influence the direction of real technology, allow me to introduce Geordie. The Joint Optical Reflective Display. Developed in the late 90s, this device was pretty much a magnifying glass made with cameras and provided augmentation for those whose vision was severely impaired. Development continued on this device improving stabilisation and functions such as contrast. Although this was not a true cure for blindness, it's undeniably striving towards that field. In most cases, optical implants are most successful where there is an optical nerve to attach to, which makes the visor even more impressive as Geordie had none. More recently, there are projects like Second Sight's Argus 2, which aims to address issues such as retinitis pigmentosa, which is a genetic issue resulting in the loss of the rods and cone cells that detect light across the back of the eye. The Argus is far from perfect, but again development is ongoing and, like a Trek visor, consists of both implanted and external components. Addressing this same issue is the retinal implant AG Alpha IMS. Unlike the Argus and similar Iris 2 systems, the Alpha IMS was a sub-retinal implant chip completely internal to the eye. The reason for the rarity of a visor in Star Trek may be explained by the real-world development of such devices. It's far easier to develop a device to aid in the recovery of damaged or failing vision than to design a cure for blindness in a patient who has never had sight nor an optical nerve since birth, such as Geordie LaForge. Medical studies are making great strides in this technology, and following the fields of cybernetics is definitely an interesting and often inspiring read. But apparently, even in Trek, it's still an evolving technology. Add this to the discomfort of the device, and we can perhaps understand why many people opted for other less obtrusive alternatives to the visor. So, thank you for staying for this video on how the visor of Star Trek works, and I hope I shed some light on some real-world devices that aim to tackle these complicated ailments. I've been Rick, and until the next video, goodbye.